do you see when you look at me? You may notice my brown hair or the fact that I'm a girl. Maybe you notice my clothing choice or even my short height. But one thing you do not see is that I'm a member of the world's largest minority, the disabled population. When Dr. Hickenlively asked me to leave the room at seven years old because he had to speak to my parents, I just played with plastic dinosaurs in the waiting room, thinking, this is what all kids do when they visit the eye doctor. I was naive. I was sheltered in a bubble of oblivion created by my parents' love and my classmates' acceptance. But bubbles only last so long. What kid wants to be told that they may never be able to drive? that they will eventually be blind, and that there is no cure yet. Good afternoon. My name is Nina, and I have Stargard's disease, a macular degenerative condition that causes the progressive loss of my central vision. Growing up legally blind hasn't been easy, but it has gifted me with a passion for life that stems from an understanding of hardship. I love my life. My resources and opportunities have put me in a position where I'm able to share my story with you today. I've been able to succeed academically and socially to the point where my friends tell me that I'm just like everyone else and that I'm an exception. And I used to take pride in that. I wore those phrases as a tattoo of validation, proving that I had somehow made it. But after the initial valid comes the deeply rooted question. If I'm the exception, then where does that leave the boys and girls in my position? The ones too marginalized to fight for their rights. There are kids who do not have access to the devoted family and economic privileges I am blessed with. There are visually impaired students who are not accommodated for their lack of vision, which prevents capable kids from graduating high school. There are kids who cannot participate in society because the stigma surrounding disability is more harmful to them than the disability itself. And there are disabled children who stand on the intersections of race, gender, and class and these kids experience discrimination for their impairments on top of racism and sexism. It's time for us to take a step back and talk about the world's largest minority. The United Nations estimates that 650 million people live with a disability, a visual, hearing, physical, or cognitive impairment. This underrepresented group faces discrimination through daily interactions and media misrepresentation. Although progress has been made through the 1960s disability rights movement, much more work needs to be done. So today, let's begin by analyzing two types of attitudes toward disability and finish off by exploring solutions to promote normalized, positive attitudes. Looking back in history, even the most successful people have worked hard to hide their disabilities. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was much more than a Harvard graduate or the nation's longest serving president. FDR is this country's most positive image of what a disabled person can achieve. At age 39, Roosevelt's polio diagnosis confined him to a wheelchair. Throughout his presidency, however, Roosevelt was committed to hiding his impairment. During photo shoots, the president would stand on excruciatingly painful metal braces in order to mask his physical limitations, and when interviewed, he would tell journalists to leave out the quote, sob stuff. But why was FDR so determined to keep a key part of his identity hidden from the public? The answer lies within the major two attitudes toward disability, isolation and glorification. Isolation is evident in the memorial service of Timothy Crook, a famous lawyer with a physical disability. 
At his funeral, close friends gathered saying, he never seemed disabled to me, and he is the least disabled person I ever knew. These words, intended as praise, served to isolate Timothy from his community. His friends were associating the idea of being able-bodied with being exceptional. It's like trying to compliment a blonde by saying, look at how smart you are despite being blonde. Here is a clash between the perception of disability and the reality. Tori Dunlap, CEO of KIT, a nonprofit organization, explains the attitude of isolation by saying, we have gone from hiding and institutionalizing kids to a world where children with disabilities are seen as special and placed in special settings with special services and special caregivers, and they and their families have become disenfranchised. Dunlap explains how the word special is simply a fancier way of saying separate. When you tell a child with a visual hearing or physical impairment that they belong in separate settings with separate services, children are taught that they do not fit in the limited definition of normal. Thus, impressionable kids lose hope of making meaningful contributions to society. The second attitude is mirrored in the media. Yet, few people realize the detrimental effects of using disability for motivation. Picture this. You are scrolling through your Facebook feed one afternoon when you come across a deeply motivational video. There is a child in a wheelchair sitting all alone in front of a basketball hoop. And there is sad piano music in the background. But don't worry, because the boy from the house next door comes to the rescue. He plays basketball with the child in the and he is a hero. A caption flashes across the screen saying, we hope this inspires you to spread kindness. It seems sweet, except for the two major issues. First, it leverages a child's disability to glorify a non-disabled hero figure. And second, according to Dr. Lawrence Lee, it promotes the idea of ableist intervention. This is the idea that disabled people cannot succeed without the help of non-disabled persons. Moving on, David M. Perry, an award-winning journalist for The Atlantic, discusses another type of glorification. A disabled person does something normal, like dance to Lady Gaga. And the viewer feels inspired because this disabled person did a normal thing. Look at them overcome their disability, the narrative goes. The media coverage of disability is often informed by some of our worst ideas about differences. As a result, changing the narrative is the first step towards rethinking these harmful generalizations and attitudes. But what is the solution? To be schools should introduce inclusion literature. Inclusion literature is any story that features a disabled protagonist. The novel Wonder, adapted into a movie, is an example of this. It relates the journey of Augie, a child with a facial deformity. By teaching these stories to young children, students can have critical conversations about disability in the same way they discuss important topics like race and gender. Sharon E. Andrews writes in her academic journal, by reading about characters with disabilities and experiencing their life struggles, students without disabilities can come to a better understanding and acceptance of people who happen to have them. Andrews explains how a connection can be formed with a character, and students can then create their own opinions when encountering a disabled person, rather than applying the attitudes they've learned from the media. And as David Perry puts it, disability is a humanity's natural diversity. So it needs to be a part of the important conversations we're having about inclusivity. By teaching empathy through literature, we create a space where disability is not only accepted, but valued. Now, inclusion literature is a policy change to school curriculum. 
but individuals can also make a difference in a four-step plan modeled by the acronym RITE. R-I-T-E stands for respect, inclusivity, terminology, and empathy. This easy step-by-step -step plan that I created is your way of taking action. The first step is respect. It is the foundation of change. Respect is an expression that you value someone and all aspects of that individual's identity. The next step is inclusivity. Be inclusive by creating safe, open, and respectful spaces and occasionally going out of your way to make sure that everybody feels included. And the third step is terminology. According to UNICEF, avoid using general terms like them, the blind, or those people. These words make it sound like all people with disabilities are the same. In addition, avoid using words with negative connotations like suffer or struggle with. Saying that someone suffers from a disability only focuses on the negative aspects of that individual's life. And the last step is empathy. Connect with people. Don't feel badly and ignore them. Listen to their stories and experiences that extend beyond disability. To sum up, right is the right process. Don't worry about making mistakes or being awkward. Just avoid making assumptions. As much as I wish I could say that I hate star guards, I can't say that. Living with Star Guards has given me a capacity for empathy and gratitude that diversifies my perspective and teaches me the value of self-advocacy. My whole life, I've been told that I'm somehow impressive for being able to graduate high school. But I am what normalization of disability looks like. One in 10 people are disabled. We are in your schools, workplaces, families, and homes. By implementing inclusion literature into school systems and consciously changing attitudes, we create a space where a disabled person can simply be a person. It's about creating a world for all. So let's start right now. Who do you see when you look at me? Thank you. Thank you.